Hello, my name is Father Gregory Pine, and welcome to the Thomistic Institute podcast for this most recent installment of Off-Campus Conversations. As you have perhaps become accustomed to hearing, the point of these off-campus conversations is to follow up with the Thomistic Institute speaker who may have given a lecture on campus or at a conference or intellectual retreat. So that way we can suss out the arguments and deepen our appreciation of the Catholic intellectual tradition in one of its many different facets. So today in this episode, I'm very delighted to be joined by Professor Jonathan Lunin. Thank you so much for joining us today, Professor. All right, pleasure to be here, Father. Thank you. My, my, my joy. Um, so uh, many of the folks listening to the podcast will know you through Aquinas 101, Faith and Science, or through lectures that you've given uh, for the Thomistic Institute or contributions to the Thomistic Philosophy and Science Conference, uh, you know, like that we have each summer in the past. But for those who don't know you, if you would just highlight, you know, who you are, where you're from, what you're doing, uh, just as a way to get to know you better. Okay. Um, so I'm Jonathan Lenin. I'm uh, the David C. Duncan Professor in the Physical Sciences at Cornell University, and I'm chair of the Astronomy Department. I'm an astronomer. I study planets, primarily planets in our own solar system, but also planets around other stars. I'm also interested in ways that we might search for life, mostly primitive life in the uh, ocean worlds of our own solar system. <clears throat> so that's my professional background. My personal background is that I was born in New York City. Uh, I'm a Catholic convert. I was raised Jewish and uh, converted um, uh, in, in the middle part of my life, uh, 40, age 46 or 47. Um, and um, I have um, founded, helped to found, I should say, um, two Catholic organizations. One is the Society of Catholic Scientists, which is a national organization, and the other is uh, a, a regional local organization to bring Catholic thought and culture to the Cornell campus, and that is called COLIS, uh, Latin for Hill. It's an acronym, but I haven't been able to practice the, the acronym properly. I'm not going to try it. Um, but anyway, it's here, and uh, we have a wonderful and talented group of people who are working hard on this. Uh, we just got started this fall. Hey, excellent. Congratulations. I've noticed with acronyms or mnemonics of all sorts, that they do help, but not necessarily for the straightforward acronomic reason. Um, it's like the trauma of trying to remember them actually proves the most helpful mnemonic device for their retention. So I'm that way with the 21 ecumenical councils, which I will not recite, but I memorized a mnemonic for them, which just results in me every time trying to recall it with great pain and suffering. So, hey, memory, strange thing. All right. So the, the lecture that you gave uh, was on the theme specifically of uh, evolutionary biology from a physicist's perspective or a Catholic physicist's perspective. Um, and in the course of that, you explained the scientific theory, and then you described what some might see to be potential conflicts or contradictions. And then you explained how um, a science operating within its proper methodological bounds and a theology, you know, sufficiently rooted in a, in a sound metaphysic, is able really to shed light on those potential conflicts and contradictions and show them to be baseless, or at the very least, show them not to be a problem in the strict sense. Um, so maybe just to start with the biology and then move a little bit to the philosophy. When it comes to the biology, you you know very carefully detailed um, the the basis of the theory, uh, and then you know like Darwin's contribution, Mendel's contribution, and then how they kind of come together in their and their reception in like the late or like the mid 20th century. But I guess just kind of starting uh, from maybe some of the presuppositions of a listener, uh, when, when many believers are introduced to this question, they, they have it introduced them kind of dialectically. It's like either you hold for creation or you hold for evolution. And I think that puts a bad taste in people's mouths uh, and it kind of makes them somewhat averse. So as a result, yeah, there's there's those hurdles or those obstacles to be overcome. Maybe you can just say a little word about um, like science, its methodology in pursuing this particular uh, this particular question. Because you said it's not just a hypothesis; it's a theory. So for that person, what would the, what would be the way in which you would start the conversation with them? Maybe to put them at ease in the setting and to help them to enter into it. 
Sure. Uh, before I do that, I do have to say that you summarized the talk much better than I actually delivered the talk. Uh, this happens very often, and it tempts me to ask uh, the uh, Tomisk Institute students at Rochester to simply replace uh, the recording of my talk with what you just said. Um, <laughs> thank you for doing that. That was brilliant. That was brilliant. Um, yeah, so science, um, of course, is a way of using um, uh, observation uh, and, and logic, uh, some would almost say uh, common sense, to understand the physical workings of the universe. And um, I will uh, remind uh, viewers that many famous scientists of the 20th century were not only Catholics, but were Catholic priests. Um, uh, Georges Lemaitre, uh, who in an anglicized way of pronouncing his last name, Lemaitre, was one of the most brilliant cosmologists of the early 20th century and um, was uh, a Catholic priest, Monsignor, prelate of the papal household, president of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences. That's just one example. So uh, science uh, can be practiced whether one is a believer in God or not, whether one is Catholic, uh, whatever faith one holds or, or doesn't hold. It, it is a way of understanding the physical processes in the universe. Now, in doing that, we assume the universe obeys um, certain physical laws. Uh, for those of us who are Catholic, those laws were established by the Creator, by God, uh, as part of the creation of the universe. Uh, and um, those laws seem to allow, along with the starting point of the universe, which in a way seems rather special and unusual, uh, for things to become more structured, more complex with time, um, for things to change in response to their natural environment. That's true for um, physical things, atoms, molecules, etc. Uh, it's also true for biological things. Um, each biological organism, every cell has uh, DNA, which encapsulates the instructions for building the proteins that uh, are both the structure of life and also the catalyst, the enzymes. Um, and there's a complicated uh, set of processes whereby DNA is both replicated and the instructions within the DNA are transmitted uh, to um, the right part of the cell to build uh, the proteins. And I explain that in the talk. So what uh, is evident about DNA is that while it replicates reliably through a very complex uh, protein-based apparatus, it's also mutable, uh, it's changeable, and it's changeable in response to natural uh, effects, chemicals in the environment, radiation, etc. But it also can just spontaneously change. Um, it can, uh, some of the instructions can be duplicated, for example. Um, and so because of those changes and the fact that those changes can lead to differences in characteristics from uh, one member of a species to another within the same species, and because um, life interacts with its natural environment, those changes can um, be amplified or um, can uh, lead to a, a preference in, in, in reproduction and therefore potentially the occurrence of new species. Um, that's natural selection. Natural selection is um, the environment, whatever that may be from the inside of your gut for a little microbe to a beautiful pine forest for uh, you know, some carnivore, some wolf in the woods. Um, that environment acts upon the natural characteristics uh, of an organism uh, and can lead to preferences in terms of um, certain characteristics being uh, persisting from one generation to another through greater success in reproduction. That's what evolution is. And um, the fossil record, uh, the, the biological mechanisms that have been teased out long after Darwin in the 20th century, um, all say that this is a process that really has acted on life over time and has led to um, the organisms that we see today, including the physical bodies of ourselves as human beings, as a product of 
um, the evolution of, um, of organisms along the primate branch. Uh, there's so much today that's known that was not known when Darwin formulated his ideas of natural selection, including um, actually watching evolution at work on a microbial scale, uh, understanding how DNA works and its sister molecule RNA. Um, but uh, the other point of this is that, that Darwin himself formulated the idea of natural selection, but didn't really understand how traits were inherited. That was work that um, Gregor Mendel, the Augustinian monk, uh, did um, almost contemporaneously with Darwin through an exquisitely beautiful series of experiments with, with plants, with uh, pea pod plants. Um, his... his um, Laws of inheritance were, were well understood, but what wasn't understood is that he himself also formulated a mechanism for how these traits would be inherited. And um, that's in the same paper with the, what we call now the laws of inheritance, uh, but were basically ignored for many decades uh, for reasons I can go into later. Um, and for that reason, the mechanisms by which traits are transmitted from one generation to the next was the subject of some debate in the first decades after Darwin published uh, The Origin of Species and the Descent of Man. Um, and um, it wasn't until um, the second or third decade of the 20th century, maybe even the fourth, that these two aspects were really put together in a complete theory of evolution. Okay, so of the theory that you describe, um, perhaps one of the elements that people find conceptually most difficult to wrap their heads around is randomness. Um, I think when when many folks hear randomness, they think kind of like lawlessness or even like an antinomian tendency. It's like these different whatever um, <clears throat> aspects of our genetic, you know, you describe the different like building blocks. What was it like? Uh, I can't pronounce them, but they have there are four of them, and they start with like A, T, something, and something else. Um, oh, yes, the nucleic acid bases, right. Yes, that's exactly what I was hoping for. Okay. I haven't studied any of this since ninth grade. Um, I am, yeah, a sea of infinite ignorance. But um, so I think that I think the one, one thing that people find discomforting is this notion of randomness because it sounds like lawlessness or a kind of antinomian tendency where it's like um, nature is asserting itself against a like whatever a putative god i think that's that's kind of the sense in which scientific uh advocates of of evolution will use it or will wield it like i have no need for this hypothesis on account of the fact that i have everything here within my system which elegantly accounts for it so maybe we can kind of like you know wrangle the discourse a little bit and describe so what what in scientific terms is randomness is it just yes. non-correlation or is it something else Right. Well, you've answered your own question. And by the way, we're all we are all infinitely ignorant uh, compared to the divine creator, who is, of course, omniscient and um, and omnipotent. And and uh, Georges Lemaitre had a had an answer to that when uh, you know he was challenged with the question of how can we really know and understand the universe with our tiny brains. But I'll get back to that, and, and maybe we'll get back to that later. So. Randomness should not be thought of in the way the word is used in a sort of a social context or an informal context, which, as you said, is kind of lawlessness, chaos, that type of thing. And even chaos has a strict mathematical term, but we think of chaos as something uncontrollable, unpredictable. What randomness really refers to is that one event is not correlated with the events preceding it, that it's not a result of either directly or even perhaps indirectly preceding events that acted on that same um, system, let's say. So if it's DNA, um, the absorption by a cell of a cosmic ray that gets in all the way through the Earth's atmosphere and um, you know maybe spalls and makes some electrons or goes in directly and hits your skin, and damages your DNA, um, that's a random process because there's no direct correlation between the cosmic ray coming in and you're having been there exposed to it. And you know maybe that causes cancer. Maybe it causes a mutation of some kind that um, is expressed in the next generation in, uh, in your gametes, uh, in your sex cells. Um, 
maybe not. So that's an example of a random uh, process. And natural selection is supposed to act on the random changes in the information carrying molecules in our bodies, the DNA that's in every cell or the RNA that's the messenger that brings that to the protein building parts of the cell. Um, and so it's that randomness that provides the kind of raw material, the creativity, if you will, for, for new species. So does that take God out of the picture? Because we imagine the creator as having a sort of a definite kind of forethought of, you know, what is desired in terms of making certain plants and animals and so forth, or, or any other process for that matter. And the answer is no, it doesn't, because to bind God's divine knowledge and power in a way that we are limited in our finite knowledge and power, and here I'm actually quoting from Father Thomas Davenport, another physicist and fellow Caltech graduate, um, to, to bind that is to make an assumption about God that is equivalent to saying that God is finite, that is like another creature. Um, God can operate through random processes because the fact that these processes are not correlated in the way that we perceive them, and therefore that one process is not causative to another process, does not mean that to the divine mind, those processes are not causative in some way one to the other, in a way that we simply can't perceive as finite creatures. Um, in fact, St. Thomas Aquinas um, allowed for the idea that contingency is a part of the plan of divine providence. Um, and uh, a quote from uh, the Summa Theologiae, which actually is coming from a, um, an essay that uh, Father Davenport wrote. Um, the quote from the Summa is, whatsoever divine providence ordains to happen infallibly and of necessity, happens infallibly and of necessity. And that happens from contingency, or what happens from contingency, which the plan of divine providence conceives to happen from contingency. So divine providence includes things that come from necessity or causative agents and things that happen contingently. Um, the fact uh, that, and now I'm quoting from Father Davenport again, the fact that a particular phenomenon has an element of randomness or contingency does not remove it from divine providence based on what uh, St. Thomas said. Um, and um, whatever happens in the world does not catch God by surprise because God, in fact, is not a part of nature, another part of nature, or even the greatest part of nature. He's nature's author and sustainer. And the, the sustaining of nature includes those processes which are random or contingent. Um, so if one can get over the idea that somehow a random process or a set of uncorrelated processes uh, is out of the control of divine providence, to get away from that preconception, I think relieves people tremendously of the anxiety of trying to fit evolution into um, the concept of divine providence. Uh, so that reminds me of this would have come up, I suppose, in the physics and then in St. Thomas's commentary thereupon, but then he incorporates it more broadly in his theology when he talks about this notion of like luck or fortune as it's sometimes rendered in Aristotle or just like chance. He says, all right, uh, with respect to our observer, you know, it seems lucky or fortunate or chancy, uh, but what you have basically are overlapping lines of final causality. Basically, one thing is acting for a purpose consonant with its nature, the other thing is acting for a purpose consonant with its nature, and then you have, you know, per accidents, right? Knots as issuing necessarily from their natures, but as just a kind of, well, this, this may as well happen. You have an overlap of their causal lines such that, you know, they meet or something happens in between them in their interaction. And the example that Aristotle uses is, um, you know, like the master sends one slave to the marketplace and then subsequently he sends another slave to the marketplace. It seems to them that their meeting is by chance uh, when, truth be told, it's they've been sent by the same master. 
Uh, and so St. Thomas uses that as a way by which to describe divine providence. Like everything, dis- you know, all of these things are well disposed within the setting of divine providence. And so they're known to the master and that his knowing of them is his causing of them, which isn't to make of God like a strange puppet master, uh, but it is to say that everything is and causes as God gives it to be and to cause. And insofar as his causality is attendant upon his knowledge, it doesn't escape, uh, you know, like the balance of his providence, and as a result of which it doesn't pose any scandal to our explanatory scheme. So I think that, you know, it's it's fascinating that a lot of these questions uh, become less troubling or less vexing when we see them within uh, a well-situated or a well-described philosophical system, because I think, you know, you hear about the God of the Gaps, when philosophers or theologians go beyond their methodological bounds and say wild things, you have problems. When scientists go beyond, you know, their methodological bounds and say wild things, again, you have problems. And then you're kind of at each other in a strange, seemingly common ground with truth be told, probably needn't pertain to one or to the other. Um, so, I'm, I mean, just kind of thinking about that in your setting, to what extent do you have to have a philosophy or a theology of chance or purpose or of providence or of causality? Is that in any way, shape or form related to how you are as a practitioner of biology or in your specific case of physics? Or is that something best left to the side? Because I know you're very convinced as to the efficacy of science, but you're not scientistic in your practice of it. So where does that where does that go? Right. So, um, yes, I, I am not scientistic, where scientistic is a kind of a specialized term for materialistic, where, you know, the assumption is that the only things that exist are material things or, you know, creatures. And one could say in, in, uh, in a classical, using classical term, um, but I am a scientist. And as a scientist, I observe the universe around me. And as a finite creature, one of the things that I observe are random processes. Now, you gave a brilliant exposition of the interpretation of random processes as, in fact, from the point of view of um, the omnipotent creator God, not random, not uncontrolled, not uncausal. Um, but as a, as a scientist, as a finite creature, um, they, they are random. And so um, there's no need to apply a kind of a filter or a template or an overlay of a kind of philosophy of what random processes are to, uh, to do science uh, and to recognize that uh, there is an aspect of the universe that is random. And again, random to us as finite material creatures within the created universe as part of that creation. Um, that is different from um, what the omnipotent God, um, the mind of the omnipotent God encompasses and understands. So um, that's long answer. Short answer is no. Random is random for for uh, for a scientist. Now there, are, you know, I will I will say this. Um, one of the interesting questions, which does kind of sit on the boundary between um, science and philosophy with regard to evolution, is whether the processes of um, the changes in DNA, particularly the ones that are spontaneous, where um, one of these nucleic acid bases that you referred to, which are the letters of the alphabet for the the instruction, may duplicate. Um, Is that process truly random? Over the billions of years of the history of life, is there something that tilts those changes and has a, a somewhat non-random causative element to it. That's a difficult question to answer scientifically, in part because the um, you know the record that we have uh, and the interpretation of that record assumes randomness at some level, and also because it's incomplete, it's very difficult to test whether it's truly random or not. So there have been suggestions by um, scientists that the universe is um, tipped toward the development of life and the evolution of uh, complex self-aware creatures such as us, but in a way that makes it very difficult to detect through the scientific tools that we have. Um, It's a question that has to be left on the table because there really is no answer to it today 
uh, but it's an interesting one. Okay, um, maybe just to follow up on that, how does that question, well, is that question related to the intelligent design question? Uh, or are they coming at that question in a different methodological fashion? Because the way I understand intelligent design is that, who have I encountered? Like Michael Beakey will say things like, there are certain aspects that can't be explained from an evolutionary perspective because they're irreducibly complex and the antecedent structures wouldn't, yeah, there wouldn't have been a reason for them to develop. So you need to account for these like kind of quantum leaps. And one thing that I've heard them cite is a flagellum. Um, and so, but, but it seems like this is the type of thing that could be assessed with the fossil record. Um, and with genomics, is that, is that a related question or is that a different question? I think it's really a different question. I mean, the intelligent design idea that uh, you've quoted Behe and, Behe and others is, as pushing does have that assumption built into it that I think really can be falsified, which is that there are certain irreducible structures that simply can't be produced by evolution. Um, and, you know, there, there have been... Um, a number of good books that have been uh, written by by biologists who um, are not only um, biologists but also Catholic, and I'm I'm drawing a blank on his name. Uh, only a theory. Um, you cited uh, Ken Miller in your talk. Ken Miller, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Ken Miller. More coffee, please. Um, <laughs> you know, he he has exquisitely taken down um, the assumptions behind. Um, intelligent design and, and shown that um, structures that seem to be irreducibly complex really can be built out of um, other um, pre-existing pre-existing structures and and part of the problem is that um, there are assumptions about how to define complexity that I think box you into the idea that you know something really complex has to come from something really simple but you can't quite see how 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 it can happen it's better to think about evolution as um, structures and processes and mechanisms that have been developed for something uh, in response to something else or are good for something else in the environment, get through the process of evolution combined to become um, this thing that has a different function to it. Uh, and he gives examples of some of those. I, I think part of it even is, is, is uh, it's part of the flagellum story. Um, you know, he also talks about, uh, I mean, he is at debates. Ken Miller is, has appeared with uh, a mousetrap, uh, you know, a very elaborately designed mousetrap uh, and shown that, you know, if you pull some pieces off, still kind of works as a mousetrap. Not quite as well, but it still works. And so, um, you know, the summary of that is that I think there's not compelling evidence for intelligent design. What I was really referring to was something a lot more subtle, was whether, you know, the randomness is, is truly random in the mathematical sense, completely uncorrelated, or if there are um, processes um, uh, involving the, the known laws, or even um, uh, Paul Davies, a physicist, has written books arguing that there's a fifth law that we're missing that kind of tilts things toward life. And, you know, I... I put it on the table. I'm not endorsing it. Uh, I think that um, our understanding of evolution seems to be that random processes work perfectly well in explaining the um, the progression of life that we see. Um, but uh, it, it's a question that people ask, particularly with respect to the origin of life. Um, so very different, though, from intelligent design. Gotcha. Okay. So maybe then just to tease that out further, would, would arguments of this type focus on like the statistical improbability or the very low statistical probability of like life and then intelligent life developing given the different uh, like factors at play? Is that the idea or is that part of the yeah, idea? Yeah, so part of, uh, that's right. And, and so some of what Paul Davies talks about, and he does it from the point of view of, um, you know, postulating this. He's not endorsing it necessarily or pushing. He's written two very interesting books. One is called The Fifth Miracle, I think, and the other is called Cosmic Jackpot. They're both popular books. Um, is that um, there, is a, there is a level of improbability to the origin of life itself, particularly to the origin of life, that perhaps points toward some 
principle of self-organization beyond what normal thermodynamics would give you. Actually, thermodynamics gives you, as far as thermodynamics is understood, um, a principle of self-organization that comes from the fact that um, even though as physical processes occur, what we call entropy, which is a kind of a measure of disorder, and speaking of it in a very rough way, or a measure of the possible number of states of a system, um, even though entropy increases, and we think of that increase of entropy as leading to more disorder, what it actually does is it leads to more self-organization, that as systems that are very far from equilibrium, such as the Earth is today with the sun shining in the sky and providing all this high-quality energy, um, that system is very far from equilibrium. And systems like that, even though they are generating entropy like crazy, also have space for self-organizing, complexifying systems. And so um, that is baked into the universe as, as we live in it. And, and in fact, our universe um, started with a very, very, very low amount of entropy relative to what it could have. That's another discussion that comes from uh, Roger Penrose, a British mathematician. Um, so that's baked into the universe. But what Paul Davies asks is a question, does it still need a little bit more push to get something like life? Are things still improbable enough that there's a principle that perhaps we're missing that um, allows for that organization to lead to life or not? Now, I want to emphasize, again, this is you know personal point of view from the point of view of my faith, um, our faith, either, either option is completely consistent with the assurance that all of reality not only was created by an omnipotent God, but is, is held in, in place, is, is held in existence all the time by God, by um, that which confers existence on everything, we participate in that existence. It doesn't matter if it's completely random or there's a small tilt or there's some principle we're not quite understanding. That has no effect on um, our faith-based understanding of what the, the ground of all being really is. Um, it was a while back, maybe like 15 years ago, there was some exchanges in first things and I remember contributions by Stephen Barr, who was arguing for, um, you know, just evolution straightforwardly, a kind of theistic evolution uh, or a non-atheistic evolution, perhaps that's the best way to describe it. And then there were some contributions along the lines of intelligence design. And then there were a third set. And I remember Cardinal Ivory Dulles wrote one who was suggesting that there seems to be like a need, as it were. And he was arguing for this philosophically for a kind of input energy at each stage in which creation levels up. Uh, in its evolutionary history. So like from non-animate to animate and then from non-rational to rational being the big transition points. And with respect to non-rational to rational, you have the infusion of the human soul. Mm -hmm. But I was, yeah, I was interested in this particular transition point, which you've, you know, we've just been describing be between non-animate and animate. Um, <clears throat> and this idea that there might be a need for any, he kind of gestures towards it respectfully and ambiguously, not purposefully ambiguously, but simply saying like, I don't know what I could say beyond it, beyond what I have just said. Um, and this idea of like, you know, like a fifth law or, you know, cosmic jackpot is a cool way to name a book, um, that there might be some, yeah, some thing for which we have not accounted. I think here you see the methodological difference of the scientist and the philosopher theologian. Uh, the philosopher theologian is inclined to say like, I know who that is. Uh, whereas the scientist says, like, if I were to stay within my methodological bounds, like, I won't be disappointed. You know, it doesn't make me an atheist to say, well, let's pursue this scientifically right. and see what we can we can suss out. Um, yeah. So I don't know if you have like thoughts on like what 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 is that phenomenologically or experientially? You're not suspending belief or bracketing belief. You're a believer, but you're practicing science. And that's not what materially speaking, an act of atheism. What is that like? Yeah, so first of all, I've written this down. I want to make sure I get the quote right because I'm going to use it frequently. I don't know what to say beyond what I've already said. Is that right? <laughs> That's right. 
<laughs> okay, I'm going to put that in my wallet. Um, yeah, I don't really know what to say beyond what I've already said. Um, it's um, you're absolutely right. Um, as a scientist, um, there's a set of techniques and approaches that um, for some scientists, and I think mistakenly for them, they see as, um, uh, as, as hinging on the assumption that there, there is no, no God, that there is no divinity, that um, there are only material things or not spiritual things, so on and so forth. Um, those are assumptions that they make that sort of frame their mental picture of reality, but actually don't affect the way they do science relative to the way I do science or the way the Vatican astronomers would do science or the way that Lemaitre did science or the way that um, Gregor Mendel did science or uh, James McElwain, the Jesuit seismologist, so on and so forth. Um, because the marvelous thing about science is that you're simply asking, and maybe in my case, it's asking God, I don't know for a materialist what they're asking, asking to be able to use the human mind to simply uh, interpret and understand observations uh, about the world and then use the tools of mathematics which themselves are really cool philosophically. We can get into Platonism versus other things. Um, you know, use the tools of mathematics to, um, to quantify, um, to be able to predict uh, based on these observations what might be happening if you change the conditions or uh, change the time scale or something else and test that with more observations. Um, now, there are some aspects of science where you just can't do that. Um, People who work on inflation uh, and, you know, what happened at the time of the Big Bang, they kind of run up against a metaphysical wall at some point and their models become purely mathematical. And, you know, they're very cool, but um, I don't think I'm going to live to see someone discover the multiverse or, um, you know, anything like that, because intrinsically um, it's, it's not really testable, but the mathematics is interesting. So, you know, science bumps up against these metaphysical boundaries in some places, but, you know, away from those walls, um, it works perfectly well, no matter what you believe. Um, the one thing I think perhaps is, uh, has a sort of a, 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 a faith-based overlay to it is when one thinks about why it is we can do that, uh, I mean, why is it that our brains, which um, from an evolutionary point of view, uh, evolved to um, allow us to avoid predators, to be able to gather food, um, who knows what else, um, to be uh, able to investigate uh, dark energy or measure the rotation uh, rates of galaxies um, billions of light years away, um, or understand what's happening inside the tiniest cell. Albert Einstein said the, the eternal mystery or the great mystery of the universe is its comprehensibility. And almost at the same time, within a couple of years of that, <clears throat> Georges Lemaitre, again, remember, was also a cosmologist and a Catholic priest, said that um, the believer and the non-believer do the same thing. They attempt to tease out from the palimpsest of nature, the faint clues in nature, um, how the universe works. But the believer has an advantage in knowing that the problem has an answer because there is the creator that created us to be able to understand and appreciate in this very profound way his creation. And science is a process of doing that. Um, and I think where the atheist and the believer meet as scientists is in appreciating how um, unusual and beautiful and majestic aspects of the universe really are that come from the results of science. Well, wow. uh, that's very beautiful um, and helpful to me. This idea that the intelligibility of the universe corresponds to our intelligence and that there's a kind of um, conversational dimension, as it were, to the mind's inquiry. And that's true, regardless of whether or not it's acknowledged such, but to enter into it as a conscious or intentional event 
is uh, somehow more natural, um, a little less violent than asserting oneself over and against nature so as to like dominate it or excavate it for the purpose of pillage, you know. Um, That's right. So, I've written 300 papers. I am now the master of the universe. Uh, <laughs> That's the side of science we don't want to get into. Yeah, perhaps, perhaps best not. As I uh, labor with my final chapter of my dissertation in hopes that I will be delivered from this body of death. Um, <laughs> uh, so th thanks so much for taking the time. Uh, thanks so much for yeah, continuing the conversation. Um, we'll look forward to you know future contributions on the Thomistic Institute podcast at the Faith and uh, Thomistic, or excuse me, the Thomistic Philosophy and Science Conference and. Like, ex exciting thing. It's on the books that you're to teach a class at the Dominican House of Studies with Father Dominic Legg um, next semester. Do you mind saying a word about that? Happy to do that. <clears throat> I will be a, a visiting scholar, uh, McDonald Agape visiting scholar at uh, the Dominican House of Studies. I want to thank the foundation uh, for their generosity in making this possible. And uh, I will be teaching a course uh, entitled Knowing the Universe. Uh, it's a course uh, that uh, is intended both to teach about our modern understanding of astronomy and uh, in concert with um, Father Dominic Legg and other theologians to then uh, bring into conversation uh, those aspects of the universe that perhaps bump up against the metaphysics and um, you know, bear um, consideration and meditation from, from a theological and philosophical point of view. So I'm really excited about it. Uh, I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, I know that it's going to go by way too fast, but uh, it's a wonderful opportunity and uh, uh, a real blessing uh, and uh, something I'm very thankful for that I've, I've been given the opportunity to do that. Yeah, that's tremendous. Well, I'll be in D.C. up until like January 11th, so I'll look forward to seeing you and perhaps oh, chatting wow. with you and maybe sitting in on the first lecture. Great. Um, but yeah, until such time, all the best in the rest of this semester's endeavors. And um, for those of you listening to the podcast, thanks so much for having tuned in. If you haven't yet, please do subscribe to the Thomistic Institute podcast, whether on your podcast app or on YouTube, uh, and then look forward to future good things coming out on the channel so that, yeah, you can grow in your appreciation of the Catholic intellectual tradition and ultimately be of service in this work of evangelization. So know of our prayers for you. Please pray for us, and we'll look forward to chatting with you next time on the Thomistic Institute podcast.